Want to be a successful academic researcher while taking it easy? Want to succeed without actually contributing to science in any meaningful way? Want to become an academic celebrity on the heels of questionable research practices? Well, you're in luck, because today we're going to learn how to become famous by p-hacking. On a more serious note, in 2011, Joe Simmons, Leif Nelson, and Yuri Simonson published an academic paper titled False Positive Psychology, Undisclosed Flexibility in Data Collection and Analysis Allows Presenting Anything as Significant. In this paper, they first demonstrated just how dangerous what is now well known as p-hacking can be. In short, they showed that what were once conventional research practices could result in incredibly high levels of what we call type 1 error or false positive results. These are results that allow researchers to publish papers with results that actually have little basis in reality. Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and this is my series of videos on p-hacking. In part one of this series, we're going to dig into just how p-hacking works and why, when abused, it can undermine our confidence in science. In the next four parts, we'll dig into specific techniques that unethical researchers might use to actually p-hack their data with the goal of developing an intuition for just why those techniques are so bad. And in the final video in this series, I'll explain a brilliant tool that these same researchers devised called a p-curve that helps detect these types of bad practices. As a quick aside, I'm personally very connected to this story as Joe Simmons is a collaborator of mine, Leif Nelson was my academic advisor long ago in grad school, and Yuri Simonson is a good friend. So aside from knowing this work well, I value the contributions of these researchers on a very personal level. Now, before we get into the specific ways in which p-hacking occurs, we need a quick primer on what p-hacking is and why it's so problematic. In short, many academic disciplines have decided, mostly arbitrarily, that if a result they report has something called a p-value that is below 0.05, that is considered scientifically credible. Anything with a p-value above 0.05 is considered not as having enough evidence to meet standard levels of scientific confidence. I won't go too deeply into what statistical significance is, but I do have a different video covering that, which I'll link to below if you want to learn more. Anyway, this cutoff acts as a very strong incentive for researchers. If your research finding has a p-value below 0.05, you can probably publish the result in an academic journal. And this is critical for academic success. For researchers, success is defined by research publications, and without them, you just don't get promoted and you could easily lose your job. So researchers really want to get results that have p-values below 0.05. The problem then is bad incentives. Researchers should be incentivized to find true findings that advance knowledge, but they are actually incentivized to publish papers. So if you are a researcher who just spent years of your life working on a research project, only to find that a key result comes back with a p-value of, say, 0.07, in this weird world of cutoffs and incentives, you're screwed. You can't publish your results, but if you engage in what have become known as questionable research practices, you can try to come up with ways to massage your data to get you below that all-important cutoff of 0.05, allowing you to reap the glory that comes with publishing academic papers. But how do you do that? To be clear, there are really bad ways of doing that, like fabricating data and deleting bad observations, ones that don't conform to your predictions, but those are incredibly uncommon and not what we're talking about here. In most contexts, those types of actions would be considered straight up fraud, and if discovered, would likely result in you losing your job pretty quickly. What we're talking about here is a lot more subtle, but arguably just as bad. Unlike fabricating data, p-hacking is a lot more nuanced. But before we get to the nuance of p-hacking, if you could take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content I put out, I'd really appreciate it. With that said, let's dig into p-hacking. Generally speaking, p-hacking involves looking at data in slightly different ways from what is optimal and, in most cases, on the surface, doesn't seem problematic at all. In my field of social science, many of those questionable research practices were pretty much standard operating procedure for decades and only became questionable once the Simmons, Nelson, and Simonson paper was published. For folks who are deeply rooted in statistics, that might come as a major shock. But you have to realize that the intuition behind why those practices are so bad is actually very foreign to most researchers who aren't themselves statisticians. Indeed, that's one main reason I'm making this series of videos. A lot of us now know not to engage in these questionable research practices, but I bet that most of us still don't really understand why. This series of videos is meant to get just at that intuition. To be clear, there are more than just four questionable research practices, but in my experience, these four here are the ones that are most common 
and most misunderstood. Dropping conditions, selective reporting of measures, covariate misuse, and selective data collection stopping rules are the ones that I think are most common and the ones that Simmons, Nelson, and Simonson call out directly. And though a bit dated, another group of researchers, Leslie John, George Lowenstein, and Drajan Prelik, tried to measure the extent of these questionable research practices by psychologists, of which, by the way, I consider myself to be one. To much surprise, these researchers found that these practices were wildly common. 27% of researchers claimed to drop conditions, 63% claimed to not report all measures used, and 58% claimed to make data-stopping decisions based on statistical significance rather than pre-specifying sample sizes. It's worth noting that they don't measure how often people misuse covariates, but as an active academic reviewer and an editor at an academic journal, that's one I do see often and it makes me very concerned. Now, to be fair, those findings are from over a decade ago, and much has changed since. But it would be naive to think that this now never happens. And it would be further naive to think that this only happens in psychology. There is evidence of these types of questionable research practices in a host of other academic fields like economics, public policy, and medical research. And these practices need not only exist in academia. Practitioners have basically the same set of incentives that academics do to find something interesting. As soon as those incentives exist, people will exploit whatever they can to get ahead. Now, not all people will do this, not by a long shot, but some will. And it is up to all of us to figure out what those best practices are and to encourage everyone to avoid them. As you'll see in the coming videos, just understanding why those statistical practices are problematic is half the challenge. So stay tuned for much deeper dives into each of these questionable research practices with the goal of getting a deep, intuitive understanding of what p-hacking really is. Now, if there are other types of p-hacking you can think of, please do leave a comment below, and I'll make sure to keep the conversation going. Finally, as always, thanks so much for watching.